What's up hobby friends and welcome to my three-part video series on how to paint Marvel Crisis Protocol's Dr. Octopus. In this third video, I'm going to cover painting the tentacles, including a deep dive on how to figure out the placement of lights and shadows, and then finishing up with the pink energy blaster, orbs, and goggle lens. To paint the silver non-metal metal, we're using AK Dark Sea Blue, Gray Blue, Spectrum Blue, Greenish White, and White. To paint the Magenta Energy Blast, Orbs, and Goggle Lenses, we're using AK's Dark Sea Blue, Scale Color Fuchsia, AK Fluorescent Magenta, Scale Color Tenere Yellow, and AK White. Glazes are applied to nuance the entire model with Vallejo Game Air Scarlet Red and Hexed Lichen. So tackling the non-metal metal tentacles for Dr. Octopus, he's got the four plus the little bit on his backpack, is and can be fairly daunting. Um, a lot of people think of non-metal metal as some sort of um, really tough challenge because it is a metallic surface, but you're doing it with non-metallic paints. They often struggle with figuring out how to place their lights and shadows, and as a result, tend to avoid it entirely, or they don't go far enough because they don't understand how to approach this kind of material and technique. So in this video, I wanna focus less on the specific colors I'm using and less on the mechanics of um, shading and highlighting, but more on the theory and the approach. I'm gonna demonstrate on one of these tentacles and really demonstrate and talk through the process of figuring out our placement of lights and shadows, um, why we're placing highlights and sh shadows where they would be, and for what reason. So um, whether it's from a primary light source or from a reflected light from somewhere in the environment, I'm gonna talk through in this video. So the colors that we're gonna be using are AK Dark Sea Blue as the base coat, which I've already airbrushed onto the model. And then from there, we're highlighting up through gray blue spectrum blue, greenish white, and then once we've done an airbrush nuancing phase, we'll go back in with pure white to um, finalize our highlights and apply our brightest spots of value. The specific colors don't really matter, it just comes down to your personal preference, but really it's a dark to light progression. So before we dive into the model, I actually want to talk through the the theory of how to figure out where we we're placing our lights and shadows. And I'm gonna be using this wooden cylinder. Now, um, this correlates well to Dr. Octopus's tentacles because they're essentially an entire segment of cylinders um, sneaking along a path. So it's very easy for us to take something like this, um, demonstrate it on one little object and then extrapolate it over the entire model. But the exact same theory applies to any other basic shape, whether it's like a sphere, um, a cube, um, a flat plane, etc. So let's see if I can demonstrate this. So right now, I have one light shining from the right side of this cylinder. And you can see that we're getting our bright light right here. This is our brightest point. And as it fades, or as it curves around, we're angling further and further away from our light source up until the middle point right here where we actually get our deepest shadow. And that's because this side where it is perpendicular to the light source, it is getting the least amount of light. As the cylinder curves all the way around to the back, we're starting to get reflected light. Objects behind that bounce and reflect light from our primary light source, which is the lamp, and then head back in the opposite direction into the other side. Now, the reason this is happening is because light always travels in straight lines. And when the light travels from its initial direction, from the light source from my lamp, and it's going this way, it's bouncing off this right side. And the, the more the angle of the surface faces directly towards the light, the brighter it is. And the more it curves away, the darker it gets until it gets to where it's no reflected light. And then as it curves around, when the light travels in that straight line, bounces off whatever object is behind the cylinder, it 
the light travels back in a return angle, a return line, to hit the opposite side of the cylinder. So you can see right now that we're getting a lot of bounce light from the paper. And what happens right now, because the paper is um, on the surface of the table, a lot of light's actually hitting the paper and it's bouncing off at an angle facing away from the cylinder. If I were to take this paper and curve it so that it is um, parallel to the cylinder, you can see how much brighter the back of it is becoming. If I were to curve this paper all the way around to cover this side of the cylinder where it's facing away from the primary light source, you can see the light's bouncing back in and illuminating it, eliminating that shadow entirely. Well, not entirely, but almost entirely. It's important to remember that reflected light is never as bright as the primary light source. So no matter what's happening on this backside here, unless there is another light source right here, that is the same intensity and distance as the lamp, which is a primary light source, this back side of the cylinder is always going to be darker in value than this part right here. It's also important to remember that if you take this halfway split, right where this uh, deeper shadow on the cylinder is, and move forward, the darkest part of this cylinder is going to be brighter than the brightest part of the back part of the cylinder. Okay, so that's very important to remember when we go to approach painting our Dr. Octopus. When we're painting non-metal metal, it's also important to consider the actual reflectivity of the material. Now, there are two extremes when it comes to painting metal. The first is something highly reflective, um, almost chrome-like, where it's like a polished surface, and it reflects everything in the environment pretty well. Um, I'm using a pair of tweezers for this. It's got a lot of surface marks and stuff, so the reflections aren't perfect. But you see that as I pan it around and it's starting to reflect the lights above as well as objects around it, how the highlights and the shadows get really sharp and it jumps from bright to dark to bright very quickly. And when we're painting metal that's much more reflective, we need to account for that in our highlights and shadows. We need to have much sharper and sudden jumps between our brights and our darks. And it's the placement of the two side by side that can really sell the effects. So even if you're trying to cheat the non model model and sort of just um, applying the highlights and your shadows willy-nilly, with some broad sense for general lights and shadows, even if you're not accounting perfectly for all the reflections, you can get away with it as long as you can um, balance out the placement the side-by-side -side placement of these brights and darks. You can fake a lot of it. On the opposite end, you have something that's more matte, much more of a, a brushed metal look. I'm using a pair of scissors for this, and you can see that as I'm rotating it around in the exact same space, the highlights are much more diffuse. You get a much softer transition from light to dark to light. And even though we're trying to get those, um, or the lights and shadows are still being placed side by side, the transition and the jump between the two is much softer than on something like this pair of tweezers. So it's important when you're painting non-metallic surfaces to think about the reflectivity of the actual metal itself, because how you place your lights and shadows and how you transition between the two will tell a lot to the viewer of what this material is made of. Now, when I'm painting Dr. Octopus's tentacles for this model, I'm going to be going more for a balance between the two, um, leaning more into the diffuse uh, sort of brushed metal look. I'm not a huge fan of hyper-reflective chrome, although we're still going to get some really sharp highlights on the edges. Now, that's not to say that we're not going to get um, sharp jumps between brights and darks, especially um, when we hit this terminal shadow on the cylinder. It just means that when we're tackling our primary light source, as well as reflected and bounced light from objects around the metallic surface, the impact is not going to be as sudden like it would be on a pair of chrome tweezers. So I've got some uh, dark sea blue, gray blue, and spectrum blue on my palette. We're not going to go all the way to greenish white yet. We want to start thinking through with some of our mid and dark tones, our initial placement of lights and shadows. We're going to deal with highlights from the primary light source first, 
and then we'll deal with the reflected light from stuff directly behind, and then we'll tackle some highlights coming from Dr. Octopus himself, as well as maybe from the, uh, the base and the ground. So for this model, my primary light source is three quarters top down from his face. So we're going to account for that by just taking our gray blue, and we're just gonna paint a strong highlight running down the front. Now I'm not too worried about um, blending any of the colors in right now. What I wanna be doing is blocking in my colors, blocking in the placement of lights and shadows because it's much easier at this phase to be sketchy, be loose with it, and we can afford to make mistakes and not be too committed to any brushwork. Now I'm going to avoid um, trying to get any paint into the crevices in between each of the, I guess, the segments of the tentacles. But if you do, we'll go back in afterwards with some glazes of the dark sea blue and correct it up. Not a big deal. So that's going to be um, probably where I'm going to be placing my highlight area. I can mix some dark sea blue into the mix. And for the reflected light, if we flip it around, it's going to be on the opposite side. So from behind the model, I'm using a 50-50 mix of the gray blue and dark sea blue. Now, as this tentacle curves to the top, it's going to start facing upwards, skywards, and it'll probably get fairly bright because we are doing a um, environmental from the sun. So it'll probably transition to this gray blue on the uh, top side as well. Now on this side of the tentacle right here, because it is angled uh, slightly downwards, we're gonna get bounce light from the ground. So maybe we wanna place a bit of a, a highlight coming from the bottom. And similarly, where we have Dr. Octopus's body, it's probably going to illuminate this side as well right here. And I'm going to keep pushing the highlight side for the primary light. We're just going to push that brighter and brighter and brighter into our spectrum blue up top here.
I'm just focusing the spectrum blue right now on the top. And I'm wrapping this highlight around to the top of this tentacle as well. Because I think what's going to happen is um, the sky, like I mentioned, is going to have a lot of light, um, eluding not just in the front, but from the top. So even though we are going to push this front part brighter, um, almost to white here, I think the top of this tentacle is still also going to receive a fairly strong highlight from the sky. And as it pulls around to the back, we're just going to fade that into our uh, gray blue. Again, no, I'm not actually trying to um, smooth up my blends. I'm just sort of really quickly, very loosely blocking in um, how bright I think this tentacle needs to be. And then I'm adjusting the values all across as I go. I'm not focusing on any one particular element. but trying to get a sense of the entire piece. So I think on this side of the tentacle right here, because of its proximity to this other tentacle, we're actually probably gonna get some uh, reflected light happening off of this metal as well. So I'm going to put a highlight, I think, right here. Um, it's the glaze of dark sea blue really de quickly down here to uh, not lose this uh, shadow line, I think, which is going to be uh, kind of important. So I think the reflection here, um, right at the base that's coming from this tentacle, it's going to be fairly diffuse, fairly um, fairly dark relative to some highlights I may receive from something closer. And then over here, where we're going to get some reflections happening from the actual suit itself. I think it will be the strongest right here, right at the base. And then as it fades to the bottom, as it curves, it'll get uh, darker and darker until it blends in with the um, reflected light we have happening. Right there. So what we can do now is we can start introducing our greenish white. Now on the palette, this color does, it does what it says. It is fairly a greenish white, but once you mix it in, it ends up being a pretty cool white um, without a lot of strong green tones. So I like this color. It's uh, just a step down from white. And we're gonna keep reinforcing some of these brightest points. I'm going to start focusing this really on the top of the tentacle. And then as we work our way down this, the front, I'm going to narrow the highlight more and more. And then widening it a bit at the base to account for 
the reflected light that's happening in the bottom. Now, when you're painting these um, highlights and shadows on something like this, you don't need to have the highlights perfectly placed running um, at the exact same width running down. I think little imperfections can help sell the idea that this is a, a moving fluid object that has, has some use to it. It's not factory fresh. Um, slight imperfections in the surface, along the edges, um, and then even like some misalignments in the actual uh, segments themselves can all create uh, little imperfections along the way that mean that we can be a little sloppier uh, when it comes to our highlights and shadows. And it can help give the illusion that this is not a um, a mechanical, perfectly painted piece, but something that's real, and has a bit of life to it. So I'm imagining um, from the ground and from the back over here, we're getting a bit of a stronger reflected light from something that's happening um, just in the environment behind him, something around like the, the human height. But I will um, fade as I bring it up to the uh, middle portion and then brighten back up as I get to the top, again, accounting for that sky. I'm going to take pure greenish white now and just finalize some of the highlights up top here. And then rather than carry it um, smooth all the way to the top, I'm going to leave a bit of a, um, a medium toned band up here and then put another bright highlight line just beside it. just so we can get a little bit of extra um, reflection happening, a little bit of extra detail going on, just to sell the idea that it's um, fairly shiny. Make sure we carry that highlight through onto the, uh, the mounting cylinder, I guess, that connects the tentacle to the backpack. I think I want to do the same thing on the uh, base of the tentacle right here. Just put a little bit of a another highlight reflection happening. And I'm trying to preserve a bit of a mid-tone line in between, which I am losing a little bit, but that's okay. So I'm going to mix up some dark sea blue and gray blue. Just try and bring that line back.
And I once we're pretty happy with this placement of lights and shadows, what we're going to do is we're going to start taking glazes of our dark sea blue and our gray blue and spectrum blue. And we can start smoothing out the transitions between these different steps. And we're just running um, very diluted mixes of these mid-tones and dark tones wherever we feel um, are needed. And they're diluted enough that they're not going to immediately become opaque. But we can use them to help smooth out these transitions and sort of hide any issues or correct any issues from our sketching phase. So up here where it gets a little brighter, instead of using dark sea blue, uh, I'm using gray blue and spectrum blue here. And we're just going to work up progressive layers of glazes that will help to make these blends just a little bit neater and a little bit smoother. I think at the base of the uh, template here, maybe we want to try and get a little bit of extra brightness in here, maybe another highlight. Just make sure that you're double checking all of your angles, um, trying to get everything uh, nice and smoothed out. 
And also make sure that you're not missing anything, any highlights that should be there but aren't. So just now I missed a big dark section on the underside of the tentacle. And as you're doing it, if you feel like you want to add some extra highlights, go ahead. Um, you can sort of fake it with, the, especially on a gaming miniature like this. It's not a diorama. You don't know, or there's there's nothing visible in the environment around that you can say, oh, there is or isn't an object here. So you can sort of get away with a lot of fakery um, to help simulate stuff that is happening in the environment. Or you can say, oh yeah, there's something there that's reflecting a light. Light is so complex, especially with the um, something, even like a simple cylinder that's sneaking around, so many reflections could be happening that you can really get away with a lot. And as long as you sort of get that initial or the, the broad sense of where the big highlights and shadows are going, you can throw in a lot of extra stuff and get away with it. That's artistic license, I guess we want to call it. I want to brighten up this little area of the tentacle here um, to account for some of the reflections happening from his foot. So we'll just add some bright highlights here, we'll brighten up this line. Now, ultimately, how long you spend on this is entirely up to you. Um, you can get away with a simple light to dark blend and nothing else and still sell the illusion that it's non metal model. But the more detail we add in here, the more interesting it'll look. If you're ever unsure, I highly recommend Googling references. Um, there's so much out there. You're bound to find something that you can use um, to help you figure out how to apply light and shadow for whatever you're, uh, you're painting. At the very minimum, think through the four basic shapes. So you have a cylinder, a circle, sphere, I guess, in 3D, a cube, and then the, uh, the cone. Everything in nature is essentially made up of these four fundamental shapes or a combination thereof. And if you understand how to um, apply light and shadow to these four objects, you can think through and break down anything. So once we have our basic light and shadow applied to the actual cylinder, we want to start um, doing some of the edge highlighting. We're going to want to highlight all the way around on the top and bottom edge of each of these segments. And the reason being because they are adjacent to other metallic objects, they're going to be reflecting light that's bouncing off of them from your light source. So Unlike, say, uh, a piece of armor or even this chest piece right here or the belly piece, where you're going to get highlights running along the top um, and none on the bottom. I did put one here for a reflected light or rim light, for example, here. Because this isn't necessarily metallic, or I guess I mean, maybe this banding is a better example. How at the top, because that's where it's getting the light, and then on the bottom, not really because it's not metal. I did end up painting some rim lighting on this, so maybe this is a little more metallic than I want. That's okay. We're gonna to wanna to do the same for this tube. So we're gonna take our Spectrum Blue first, and we're gonna run a highlight all the way around, top and bottom. Okay. 
Now be as um, thin and as accurate as you can with these edge highlights because it can be very difficult to correct the blending uh, and thin it out if you make a mistake. And this can get a little tedious, so I highly recommend that um, you take this in chunks. Do it bit by bit if you have to. Do a little bit at night. Um, put on a good movie, audiobook, podcast. And then we'll take our greenish white. And then on the top, we'll apply another edge highlight. Focusing on the front. A little smaller one on the bottom. And then if you want on the back, you can maybe put a, a little dot, just like a specular highlight. So that's pretty much it. Um, very, very straightforward. To get it to this point, I'm going to go off camera and paint the rest of the tentacles in this way, get all the blending up, do all of the edge highlighting, and then we'll come back for the next step. So with all of the tentacles and claws highlighted, I'm gonna go back in with some dark sea blue, very diluted. This is probably, uh, I would say six parts water, seven parts water to one part paint. And we're going to gently do in some glazes into the midtones and the shadows, smooth out some of our highlighting, and just deepen some of the shadows that um, I want to reinforce, particularly sort of in the middle back of each of the tentacles. So we have the compressor set to about 15 PSI, um, very diluted mix. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna be spraying a little bit. We'll pull back the trigger, do a very soft layer, and then push the trigger forward and spray only air. And we'll repeat this pull back, push forward from motion or process. And we'll just continuously layer this dark sea blue, spraying and drying as we go, and it will help to build up a very gradual, progressive layer of the color. And it's thin enough that when we apply it to sort of the brighter areas, it'll help to knock back some of that highlighting. Um, any harshness that came from sort of our sketching phase will be knocked back and it will all just um, blend more smoothly together. Now I spent a bit of time and my mid-tones are fairly smooth. It's my shadow tones are a little rougher. That's why I'm only really going in with the shadow tone. If your blends were less smooth from hand painting, or if you're working on a larger surface area where you weren't able to or didn't want to make smooth transitions with the brush, you can go in with some of your brighter tones like your gray blue, where you can do like a gray blue, dark sea blue mix and work your way from your midtone all the way back down into your shadows. And that will also help to smooth out your blends. I'm also going to focus a lot on the claws as well. So I'll cover the highlighting and shadowing of each of the tentacle arms and claws after I do this step, but um, very quickly just touching on the claws. They are a little messier, simply because I didn't want to spend too much time on them. I already spent, or I was already spending maybe 30, 35 minutes on each claw. And I exaggerated some of the highlights to pick up the details. And so what I really want to do is go back in with that dark sea blue and just under spray from the shadows and help to catch some of those uh, recessed areas. And just knock back the strength of some of those highlights. It was a little um, rougher and uh, not as smooth as I would have liked, but it was one of those things where I had already spent so long on the model. I was honestly just like, I need to get this done. I also see an errant uh, highlight there that I need to fix by hand. And with the airbrush glazing done, we're going to go back in with pure white. And I'm just using AK white for this, but um, Vallejo white or any other suitable equivalent is perfectly fine. 
and we're going to add some final paw palettes. And really we want to focus this on um, areas where we already applied our greenish white. And we just want to add that little bit of extra. And this will help to add that final pop and brightness that we want for the non-metal metal. And then you can also go back in, uh, you can refine and add some extra edge highlighting where these uh, white highlights may meet an edge. And there's no reason to go overboard doing the white on like every single segment of the tentacles. Pick the brightest spots that um, will add that extra pop and the overall uh, feel of the piece when you have that gradual shift from your mids and your darks all the way to your brights will look that much more convincing. I think if you over highlight the white on every single segment, it ends up looking too, uh, too fake. It almost looks like you um, highlighted and shaded each segment independently without considering the overall feel of um, the tentacle as a whole. Now, one thing I will note is that I'm not going to put any of these white highlights on the opposite side. Um, that's largely because my primary light source is coming from the front of the model, and it's going to be the brightest, as it should be, on the front. Any of this reflected light that's coming back in is not going to have the same intensity, at least from my own um, visual narrative, as my light source from the front. So I don't want anything on the back to be of the same value as the front. Remember that anything in our um, bright area up until the halfway point, those darkest tones are still, um, or rather the brightest tones in the back, the reflected light, will not be as bright as the darkest tones on the front half, that bright portion. So thinking through the highlights for all of the tentacles, it's pretty much the same as the way we approached this first one. We've got a strong primary highlight running down the front directly towards our light source, um, especially on this curve right here, this curve here, and this curve here, where I think they're the most prominently front facing. And as this gets curved away and blocked by the girder, for example, on this tentacle, it does darken up a little bit. Um, it darkens up on the side and on the underneath and inner portions. On this tentacle, as it curves down, it fades from the bright to the shadow. Similarly, on top here, uh, fades into a bit of a shadow and then a reflected light from areas behind. On this tentacle up top, as it curves down and wraps around, this element now becomes a bright point because I think it is angling towards the front. And then as that curves and becomes the underneath, it reaches into shadow before then curving and uh, coming back down and getting a bit of reflection from the tentacle beneath it. When we get to the back, you see a lot more of these reflected highlights I've added in. And I've taken a little bit of, of creative liberty with imagining some elements around that are creating these reflections. And the goal was to essentially create these bands of highlights to allow me to place um, mid-tones and bright tones beside my darkest tones. It did end up being a little more um, chromey or more reflective than I originally intended, but that's okay. Um, as I was painting it, I realized that a matte finish would have been a little too soft for me, and I wanted to have this more cartoony vibe to match the bright greens and yellows on the model. So I ended up pushing my highlights and my bands of brights and darks to create a more reflective surface. And it all culminates in this center backpack portion it will be a lot more bright bands because there's so many metallic elements reflecting around and into each other. When it comes to painting the claws, um, they're relatively flat surfaces, um, with the exception of some claws like on this one here, where it does curve and flare out a little bit. It's mostly tops and sides. 
So really, it's just a matter of figuring out, okay, um, how does this one facing um, face, what is the angle relative to the light source? And that determines how bright or dark it ends up being. And then from there, it's just a matter of um, tackling each panel, each segment individually, and applying your lights and shadows. It gets a little tedious, a little grindy because of how complex each one is, especially when we get to the top two, where this one especially, it's exposed on all sides, firing the beam, and then we have to account for this little burst of energy as a light source itself. So I did go a little brighter on some of the inner elements to account for the fact that this is going to be a source of light right here. And then similarly on the girder, um, where the claw clamps around, you have to deal with sudden changes in facing. So this top, for example, where it's facing the front, suddenly becomes a back where it's getting some reflected light instead of direct light. Um, overall, I think the tentacles is the most challenging part of this model. I did end up in real time spending probably four or five hours on these tentacles alone spread over the course of three or four days. If you have the mental fortitude to tackle it all in one sitting, more power to you. I find that after a couple of hours of painting the same kind of detail, I do end up um, getting a little sloppier. And so I intentionally tried to break it up over a few days just so that I could come back in for another step with fresh eyes, fresh hands, and be a little bit more rejuvenated. So however you want to tackle it, spread up or in one session, entirely up to you. And I definitely think if you want to spend three, four, or five times the amount of time on this, you can definitely um, spend a lot more, um, invest a lot more into the detailing and into getting the reflections. But I think for a tabletop piece, um, I'm very happy with how this is turning out. So there's a number of these energy elements or orbs on Dr. Octopus. So there is the orb in the center. There is an orb on the center of the backpack. And then just to keep the color palette consistent across, I'm actually going to paint his goggle lenses in a similar color, just not as bright. And then we're going to paint the energy flash in the same color as well. And I imagine that uh, the energy that's in the belt and in the backpack is being channeled through the tentacle and shot through as energy. So I'll demonstrate on this portion right here, but the color recipe and technique is carried across um, all these different elements, including the OSL that we're going to be doing. So the colors I'm going to be using for this, Dark Sea Blue from AK and Scale Colors Fuchsia. Now this is going to be my base coat 5050, and then we're going to work our way to pure fuchsia. This is mainly just to help fuchsia uh, coat on a darker color. This color by itself, doesn't coat very well. So I think mixing it with this color and building it from a mid-tone up will allow me to get uh, quicker results. From there, we're gonna mix in some AK fluorescent magenta. We're gonna see how this turns out, try and increase the vibrancy of this color. And then from there, we'll mix in a bit of tenor yellow for the final highlights. I'll then go back in with the magenta and the fuchsia in glazes in the surrounding areas to try and create that OSL look. So first we have that uh, fuchsia dark sea blue base coat. And we're just gonna do a nice coat over the entire thing. Make sure to be careful not to overpaint uh, into any surrounding areas and to really get into the crevices. So from here, we can start working our way into pure fuchsia. Now, because we're treating this energy as, or this glowy part as an energy source, um, we do want to start to think about and consider the values and the placement of the, um, the highlights for this energy orb. So I'm gonna be focusing um, my bright spot, my bright highlight right here. I'm gonna pull a, um, a ring highlight over the entire circle. On the outside edge right there. And I think I'm gonna introduce a secondary highlight right here.
Now also remember that when it comes to dealing with OSL, your primary light source is always going to be brighter than the reflected light. So if we're going to be using fuchsia and magenta um, for the reflections on the outer rims and the surrounding elements, we need to take this center portion, the actual source of light itself, fairly bright. So right now we're just going to keep working up to pure fuchsia. And I'm sort of just um, highlighting and broadening as I go. As I highlight up, I may need to tweak the placement of the highlights. I may need to, um, like I just did, combine these two because I expect to have a big circle dot right here, a big bright dot, and a dot right there. If I lay down some of this tinner yellow, I want my primary focus there and there. Like that. So now we can start taking our magenta, glazing over, and working our way to transition these colors. Now, I've never used this uh, fluorescent magenta before, so this is going to be an interesting color. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. It does strike me as a fairly um, Translucent tone though. Sorry, I'm just loading more paint onto my palette. So it's going to require a lot of layers to build up. I am liking how intense it is though. So all I'm doing right now is I am mixing in different quantities of my fuchsia, uh, my fluorescent magenta, and eventually my tenorio. And I'm just working to create that build into those bright spots. Now, if you want to try and get a sense of sort of the, the values that you need to be pushing this orb into, we can take some of this um, fluorescent magenta and we can do a light glaze into the surrounding area that we want this OSL to happen. And this will give us a relative sense of how bright we need to push the center to appropriately reflect Now, do remember that because light does travel in straight lines, this orb, especially because um, I'm imagining a daytime scene, the strength of it really shouldn't be enough to push it onto these sides here because these outer sides face away from the light source. So we're really going to see the most intense reflections on this inner edge right here. Leading into the uh, the trim, well, I guess this front edge right here. And that's really it. I'm going to mix in a bit of this pastel I have in my palette into the magenta just to add a bit of sharpness to this uh, outer edge.
Now that gives me a sense of how bright I need to take this center orb. Now we might get a little bit of OSL on the green pads here, so I'm just going to do some light glazing with the pink, or the magenta, I guess. And I'm going to fade it away fairly quickly because I don't want the light to be too intense. Um, OSL in daytime tends to be um, pretty weak. A light would have to be incredibly intense, almost like the power of the sun, um, to create a strong reflection. So we're just going to be very, very subtle with this. And to keep highlighting up the center orb, I'm just going to start mixing in the tenor yellow into the magenta. So at this stage now, I think I want to do a bit of a pop. Um, I'm not quite sure how. I think I'm going to take some white that I have in my palette. I'm going to mix it in with this tenor yellow and some magenta. And I'm going to gently put a thin white circle right here and see how it turns out. When I say white, it's not really a pure white. I'm going to carry that into the outer ring. And we'll dot this little one too. Then we can take pure white and just finish with the spot highlight on this big one right here. And I think this little one right here that just sort of appeared. Reinforce that top line. And then if you want, you can go back in with some glazes of your uh, magenta. I'm 
helps smooth out some of these uh, transitions. And then where you're glazing over the darkness, it's going to add darkness over the shadow. Um, it'll add a bit more of that tone in there. And because of its uh, very, very translucent properties, it's very easy to build up this color and sort of just nuance and, and smooth out those tones. I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. So I'm gonna repeat that process onto the lenses, but not going so bright um, because I don't want it to be uh, glowing goggles. I will do the exact same thing on the orb in the back, however. So figuring out what to do with the energy bolt is actually kind of tricky because of the way it's sculpted. It's essentially a, a cylindrical core that isn't really there, but if you imagine it's sort of like a, almost a cone actually. So the tip running down the center, culminating in the actual barrel. And then there's four fins in a cross pattern. So you really see it and focus from this angle. There's the cone core with four fins. And the way that the fins are sculpted, they're not like defined well enough where they blend into the core. So it's hard to do any sort of um, highlighting or shading based on the sculpt. But because the detail is relatively flat, I think, there's a lot of freedom to apply your highlights and it not be wrong, right? Because of the, the, the relative simplicity of the sculpt, there's a lot of leeway for you to add in your own texture and you can get away with a lot. The way I've chosen to highlight this is the bright element at the barrel um, pulled into the center. So we have a highlight line, sort of like a uh, lightning arc running down the center and from there, I can then pull highlights into each of the fins to account for each of these little rays going on here. And you can see that um, because each fin has its own unique um, patterning, you can really sort of play up this um, interesting energy texture. But otherwise, the color SB is still the same. Um, we just built it up to um, an off-white in the center there and then glazes of the magenta to make sure that the, the mid-tones and shadows are nice and saturated. So the last thing that we're gonna be doing on this model is a final glaze nuance with the airbrush over the entire thing. Um, focusing on the shadows, I'm using Hexed Lichen from Vallejo Game Air for this. Much like the Scarlet Red we used earlier, this is a very um, saturated, very intense color. So you're gonna make sure it's heavily diluted. This is about seven parts water, one part paint. And we're just going to be underspraying, gently applying thin layers of this color, and then using the airbrush as always to air dry each layer before building the next. And the only real thing that I'm going to be careful of is to minimize overspray on the pink energy elements. Now, in hindsight, you can probably do this hex lichen uh, spray first and then do the, uh, the OSL. But in particular on the girder and um, on the back portions, I do want the hex lichen to add the shading. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the OSL was laid down first before applying the shading, hence why I'm doing it in this sequence. And we're just gonna go over the entire model doing uh, continuous passes, continuing to build up the shadow color. And we're just looking to deepen up the shadows, add a bit more uh, visual interest with the purple. Um, I use this common color in all of my Marvel Crisis Protocol models as well. And it's a way of helping to introduce a color that's consistent across every model. Um, and it helps to bring everything together as one collection.
And once I'm finished with this step, all I have to do is um, repaint the base trim black. Um, we'll apply some uh, varnish with Games Workshop's Purity Seal and our model will be complete. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and follow for more awesome weekly content. I'll have links for my other social media platforms in the video descriptions below. Until next time, happy hobbying.